Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we've got an interesting one. Today we have a Merlin VSM model. This is the second time that one of these models has been brought to me for upgrades. Um, they were a very popular speaker uh, way back in their day. I'm, I want to say that these originally started maybe 20 years ago. And I remember seeing them at the shows. I've heard them a lot of times. I've heard them in someone's house. Um, they've been around. And there was always some issues with them. And that's why uh, I get asked about them quite a bit. And that's why this is the second time one's been brought to me. The first go around, the customer brought one to me. And I took some measurements on it and kind of made a plan. But before he left, he wanted to hear some of our speakers. And then he heard the ecstatic. And then that was it. There was no, he was no longer interested in me fixing his Merlins. The ecstatic was a better sounding speaker across the board. The mid bass drivers were an open baffle. It was more open, more transparent. The tweeter was just as good, but with better parts. It had sealed base with dual woofers so it was a little tighter and cleaner it had higher sensitivity it was more dynamic it was it was a next level speaker and it was inexpensive and so he decided i'm going to sell this merlin to somebody and build a set of ecstatics that was money better spent in his eyes but again there's been quite a bit of these out there and we're going to start from the beginning with the measurements I took on that I took of these things back in 2009. We're going to look at a measurement John Atkinson took in 2007, which almost matches mine to a T. And we're going to look at the latest crossover version for this thing called the Black Magic. And then we're going to look at what I was able to do with this thing. We're going to kind of go to go through the history of it a little bit. So... Let's start with an on-axis frequency response of this thing, and let's go in and try to identify some of the issues that these things had. Um, let's start with the measurements I took back in 2009. Um, the on-axis response obviously does not look that great. It's pretty choppy. Um, there is a big peak in the woofer's output around 900 hertz. There's a pretty good little dip in the response at 3,000 where... Drivers are not in phase or summing very well at that point. Um, and there's no baffle step compensation in the design. By baffle step compensation, we've talked about this before, that's where the woofer reaches a lower frequency range and the output becomes omnidirectional. A lot of the output wraps around the box and goes backward instead of just from the woofer forward. And when it does that, it loses output. Think of it as half of the output going in the opposite direction, half of it coming forward, it loses 6 dB total of output capability. Um, depending on the baffle width and stuff, it is what is the factor and depending on where that is. So below about 900 hertz or so, this thing starts dropping off pretty aggressively. But at 900 hertz, this woofer, and it's known for it, the little ScanSpeak 8545, has a amplitude peak right there, and there's a little bit of stored energy there in that region, which is definitely an audible issue. So we got two things going on here. One, the big peak in the woofer's response, and the no compensation for the step loss. And in my measurements, I'm measuring the actual speaker without any EQ systems or anything like that, so we're seeing exactly what the speaker did alone. Let's look at the crossover response, and you can see where it's crossing about 2200 hertz in my measurements. And its summation is okay. Um, as we look, though, at the vertical off-axis, now as we go vertical, the time alignment between the two drivers become a little different as you're going up, and they no longer sum. In fact, they start to cancel. So there's a pretty good little hole in the vertical off-axis. Um, now... I was told and I read in some of the information that ideally what the designer meant for this was to be listened to or measured at the top of the woofer axis and not at the tweeter axis. So if you if you drop down a little bit, the drivers will be in phase just a little bit more and it'll have a little bit smoother response. So, But even though your ear is at that level, that doesn't mean that the overall room response changed any. 
the overall room response is still going to be somewhat imbalanced because they're not in phase over a wide range. They're more in phase, you know, from there down. So a little bit imbalanced in the way it's designed. Now the horizontal off axis smooths out a little bit and it looks okay. But let's look at the spectral decay. If we look at the spectral decay, we can see some surface uh, reflections off of the tweeter there that, that are a little, a few little ridges there. And the, the tweeter does have a pretty humpy response. But the big issue is right there at 900 hertz, you see there's some stored energy there. Um, that's going to add a little residual ring to everything. And every time I listen to this speaker, I could always hear it. And then once you knew it was there, you couldn't unhear it. Now, what the designer did, acknowledging that there was no compensation for the baffle step loss. In other words, the, the base was just dropping off at the bottom. It was thin. So instead of going in and designing a crossover that balances that out, he came up with an EQ device that adds boost to the bottom end to bring that level back up. It was called a BAM, and that stood for something involving the bass. And so then when you listen to it with the BAM, it had a little more bass to it, but it brought the bass up down below 200, and it still left kind of a trough there in the mid-range, and it still left that big peak up at the very top. So it it fixed the bottom end, but it didn't fix anything else. And then there was a penalty that came with that. Every time I listened to it with the BAM system on it, I noticed either the power supply or the op amps that were in that system tended to color the signal to the whole speaker because the entire signal going to the amplifier passed through the BAM system and then was amplified. So it tended to add its own coloration to the, to the music. And I, it was just a, a bit of a hazy something there and it, it ate up some of what it could do. I didn't like the sound of it with it in there, but when you took it out, no bottom in. So um, to, conf to confirm these measurements, let's look at the measurements John Atkinson did back in 2007. Now his look a little bit different. He did measure at the top of the woofer axis, which smooths it a little because the drivers are a little more in phase. Um, and then let's look, and, and it, on this measurement that I have here, it didn't, I don't have a summation. It's the individual drivers themselves. Um, but that peak is still there and the bottom end has been lifted up because the BAM system was being used in his measurement. He also would take a near field measurement, which, which means you bring the microphone right up to the woofer and you take a measurement at a low level and then you splice that into the woofer's output and you bring it up a little bit and you figure, all right, where can I, where can it, where do they cross? And then you sum them and it makes one line out of them. And, and then there's a port output that's being added. And what happens when you do that is it, it artificially makes it look like there's more output at the bottom than there really is. Um, that happens in all of his measurements when you splice that in and I can do it too. I can splice it in and make it look heavy or lean or depends on where you splice it at what level. But that's the reason the bottom end looks a little better in his measurement. Other than that, it looks the same. In fact, let's look at his crossover response measurement and, and the one that I made. It's, it's almost identical in following the curvature of it. You can tell that you know, without the BAMP system, the, bo the bottom end is dropping off uh, pretty considerably. So it is what it is. That's why the thing was brought to me back in 2009. Um, let's look, though, at um, the Black Magic crossover. Now, this is a crossover that the customer sent to me, and we put that crossover on it and took measurements on it. That was supposed to be the latest, greatest, whatever update that you could get for it with all the best parts on it. Um, so let's look at uh, the on-axis response on it. And I could I noticed immediately, and even looking at the schematic, there's a lot bigger coil on the woofer than what was used on it before, at least it appeared to me. There's more compensation built into this thing, so it doesn't have the baffle step loss that it had before. Uh, the peak is still there at 900 hertz. There's still a pretty good little peak there. In fact, let's look at the crossover response. And you can see the tweeter was allowed to play down a little bit lower. It filled that gap a little bit, uh, but it, it's still pretty lumpy. 
Um, and looking at the vertical off-axis, we can see that they're, they're in phase over a little wider range. The crossover point was pushed down quite a bit. It's down below 200 hertz. It's probably at 17 or 1800 hertz now, which is no big deal for this tweeter. This tweeter will go down really low. Um, so as you go up vertically, it maintains a little better, um, little better response overall because the wavelengths are longer. Uh, and then the horizontal off-axis looks looks fine. Looking at the spectral decay, we can see there's still that stored energy there. There's still a big hump there. Um, and then looking at the impedance, we can tell immediately that from the original measurement, let's look at the original measurement from 2009, and then the measurement on this crossover that's the black magic. We can tell electrically that it is a different crossover than what it was. So they fixed some things there as far as the tonal balance of the whole speaker and made it a little better vertically and stuff. Um, but the biggest issue, that big peak at 900, that's still there. I don't know why they didn't design a notch filter to just drop in there and eat that thing out of there. Um, it definitely, we would have made it a lot easier to listen to. First thing I did um, when designing the new crossover was to go right in and do that. In fact, let's look at uh, the frequency response with the crossover that I designed for it. And in fact, let's look at the new crossover. I did some things a little tricky there in the tweeters curve, and I was able to manipulate that response a little bit and create a smooth rounded roll off that mirror image what I did with the woofer. Let's look at my uh, crossover response and let's look at it compared to the black magic um, crossover response that they got. You can tell there's quite a bit of difference there. Uh, I was able to make it a lot smoother. Um, and then let's look at the new vertical off axis going up. As you can see, because of the slopes that I used and the low crossover point crossing over about 1500 hertz, you can see that you can go up or down on this thing. It won't make any difference now. Uh, the crossover stays, um, it keeps the drivers in phase over that whole range. So you can stand up, sit down, it doesn't matter. They maintain the same sound and the overall balance of the room is going to be the same because they're in phase over, again, such a wider range. Also, uh, because they said, oh, you want to you want to measure it at this axis, not the tweet. So with my crossover, I have a measurement you can see here with at the tweeter axis and I drop down to between the two and you can see because they're in phase so much better that it hardly even changes that at all. So all that was great. Um, horizontal off axis. I'm not real thrilled with it. There's a little bit of peak at 30 to 40 degrees off axis uh, because the way I've got these uh, crossed. Um, I'm not too concerned with that overall though. That's pretty high in frequency and it's only 30, 40 degrees off axis. That's where your wall reflection is going to be and that will knock that down quite a bit. Now, here's the best part. Let's look at the new spectral decay. Now that I knocked that hump out of it, the spectral decay looks a lot better. And let's compare that to the spectral decay with the black magic crossover. Let's look at that one. Ooh, yeah, that's 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 a great comparison in my eyes. Um, that's a huge improvement, and you're gonna notice immediately that things gonna be smooth, balanced, no more ringing, no more residual heaviness in that area, which to me was like nails on a chalkboard. Um, looking at the impedance curve, the impedance was pulled down a little bit by that notch filter, but it's still very usable. Um, let me put my glasses on real quick. I didn't write down in bold what it dropped down to. If I can read the small print here, I think it's five ohms. So still no big deal there. Uh, we still have a nice balance impedance curve. So overall, I was able to do something with this thing to create a nice balanced response um, that you guys can finally get what you thought you got originally and you won't have to use the BAM system. You can get that out of your signal path and not have your whole signal colorized by the signature of that stuff in the path. So crossover parts also came up. We went from those Hovland parts to uh, coils from US coils, big gauge air core inductors, uh, all high purity copper, the caps the tw on the tweeter circuit all sauna caps, so that's a lot cleaner sounding cap than the Hovlands that were in there. It's going to be faster and more detailed without being aggressive. 
the, the Sonic Cap's a nice, smooth, and balanced cap. So all that's going to be balanced and a lot easier to listen to. Also, once I finish this thing, we set it up and listen to it for a little bit. And to be honest, I thought this tweeter had a little bit of sharpness to it. The customer thought, oh, this thing sounds great. And I guess from the standpoint of where it came from and listen to it now, it did sound great. But to me, I thought the top end was a little sharp with this tweeter. So I went in as we were playing it and I took the cap that was in shunt on there and I changed the value on it just a little. I dropped it just a little and I pulled the tweeter level about a dB down. And we begin to listen to it and go back to back. And the customer thought, oh, wow, it's definitely smoother and better balanced with the tweeter level down a little bit. So if you notice in the frequency response, let's look at the measured frequency response again. I voiced it with the tweeter level. not It's not tipped up in any way. The fact I brought the tweeter level down just a hair and it gave it an overall better balance. Uh, again, because this this is a fairly sharp you know, very detailed tweeter. Um, it just seemed a little bit better balanced by bringing that down. So I did do some listening to it. Once we had this thing up, did a little bite ear tweaking. We listened to it some more. Was really happy with the overall balance. So um, I think you guys, if you have these things, you're going to be really pleased too. Also, the whole cost of the upgrade is not that much money. Uh, it's $529 for all the new crossover parts. It also includes a set of tube connectors, which is an even higher quality connection than the binding posts that were on here. And it had pretty good binding posts on it, but it's going to pick up a little clarity from the tube connectors. And it's all new wiring. The wiring is now 4 nines pure copper uh, in polyethylene. It's going to be a much better sound across the board. Better detail, better clarity. Um, spatial cues are going to open up and you're going to get improved to imaging. Better balance, uh, no more BAM in the signal path. This is a one of those deals that if you own one of these speakers, this is almost a must upgrade. Especially considering they were charging eight to ten thousand dollars a pair, eight to ten thousand a pair for this easy and simple built two way speaker. Um, you know, and the cabinets were for the most part just painted MDF. They had some nice these decorative inlays on them and in this case the bottom section of this speaker is just a solid block of wood so it's a heavy speaker but it's mdf i mean it's not like it's veneered in expensive rosewood or anything this was very inexpensively made they used some decent parts in there at that time though the hovland parts were okay i don't think they were a great match for these drivers but a lot better than the crap you see at the budget level you know, speaker-wise these days that are mass-produced. This was not a mass-produced speaker. So it was good quality parts. They just, the designer just did not have the experience or the, I guess the know-how to really know how to fix this thing and smooth it out so that it didn't need electronic EQ and stuff like that. So again, if you own this thing, this is probably a must-have upgrade. I think this is going to go over really big uh, with the Merlin guys. So uh, finally... You know, some a little upgrade for you guys that you can appreciate. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any comments or um, if you want to ask any questions, you can post it in the thread below or shoot me an email on it. We should have this up on the website um, in a few days, hopefully by the time we go live with the video. So look for that there, and you should be able to order it online. Thanks for, uh, again, watching, and if you haven't, please subscribe to our channel so you get notification of new videos as they drop. See you guys in the next video.